Welcome to Boston Python. This is our March events night. Tonight, we have Paul Bissex and James Garrity speaking respectively on Pydantic and machine learning, large language models, etc. Our first speaker is Paul Bissex. Um, Paul is, All right, among other things, Paul Bissex is now a co-host of this meeting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Paul Bissex, um, is uh, one of my favorite people in the Python world, honestly. I, um, I've known him for several years. Uh, first met him uh, when he gave a very nice talk for Django Boston. Um, ended up um, convincing him to join my team at Mass Challenge. We worked together for a couple of years, and um, he taught me a lot, which I still appreciate. And now he's going to make us all smart about Pydantic and typing in Python. And take it away, Paul. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. All right. Excellent. Hi, everybody. Um, it's great to be here. Here for me is 100 miles west of Boston in Greenfield, Massachusetts. I'm along on the, the banks of the Connecticut River. Uh, unbeknownst to most recruiters who are sure that if I live in Massachusetts, I must be somewhere, you know, on the T and able to commute to any job in Boston. Um, <clears throat> So tonight I'm going to talk about Pydantic and a bit of the surrounding stuff related to type annotations. Those of you who are seasoned in type annotation uh, work will find some of that to be reviewed, but I want to sort of be expansive because uh, the long, <laughs> the long slow entry of Python 3 into the world meant that a lot of uh, cool stuff that came in Python 3 didn't get adopted as, as quickly as, as you might think. So um, I'm going to jump in just with a little bit of sort of where I'm coming from. Because of this is a short talk, I'm not going to go through my whole resume. I'll just uh, mention uh, I worked, uh, I co-wrote a book on Django. Um, the first book to cover Django 1.0, in fact. That's still the current version of the book. Django's up to 4.1, uh, 4.2 in pre-release. But my book is the best book you can buy on Django 1.0 if, uh, if you're trapped there. Um, <clears throat> That was fun, and uh, the I enjoy the covers of the translations, especially the uh, the Russian one with the snake wrestling going on. Um, so that's something I sort of established myself in the Python world with. I run DeepPace.com, which is a programmer paste bin. Um, it is wired into Django, so if you have Django running in debug mode and you hit the button that says "Share this traceback" on a public website, when you hit an error it goes to my site. So I try to keep it running for the sake of people who are hitting that button. Um, and it's a, it's a fun project and a great testing ground for things that I want to try out, but aren't part of my day-to-day -day work, or uh, I want to sort of get familiar with before I try to throw them into production in a, in a work setting. Um, I've been working remotely for uh, over a dozen years. Like I said, I live out in Greenfield, Mass. Um, one of the Perks, as those of you who work remotely know, is that you get to sort of have friends all over the world. And I have a little uh, talk I give to software engineering classes where I have a map of all the places I've had coworkers. This is not quite up to date. I've got some, I've got a couple new countries, but it's, it's pretty representative. Um, and it's, it's fun to have that lens on the world. Um, so even though there's no, there's no proper software jobs out here to speak of, I get to do what I do and, and live in a, in a gorgeous place. So it's, that's a win for our industry. Um, and I have an office that that odd fuzzy little picture is my office in town. I don't work from home. Um, I'm at home right now because it's evening time, but um, I rent a cheap office in town and that's where I've done all my work for the last dozen years. Um, it's sort of part of my recipe for sanity and the long-term remote working. Um, <clears throat> as John mentioned uh, a few years ago, I worked at Mass Challenge for several years, which is my a big Boston connection, of course. Um, <clears throat> and um, in fact, as he pointed out, I, I found out about the opening because I came and talked at, at Boston Python uh, and John came up and said, hey, we're looking for somebody who seems to be similar to you. And uh, that was a that was a great run. So that was super fun and plugged me into a lot of neat stuff uh, in Boston. Um, other jobs, other jobs. And now currently I'm working for a company called DSD Partners. Um, not only have you not heard of this company, but you might not have even heard of the industry that we operate in, which is direct store delivery. Um, what is that? Well, it, uh, Uber for Oreos is one catchphrase that somebody threw at me uh, about it. In short, if you're CVS, 
and you ran out of Halloween candy the day before Halloween, you have your special barcode reader that we gave you. You scan the UPC code on the shelf. It sends a message up to our system. That message is relayed to your distributor. Your distributor sends a nice driver with a truck full of you know Reese's Pieces or whatever you need for your uh, Halloween candy supply. Um, and it uh, it retailers it's it's great for them because it unifies communication in a very fragmented uh, industry. And this is all on there because it's a Python uh, web app. Um, I won't digress on this too much, but it's been interesting over the past several years, the variety of architectures of Python web apps has really grown. It used to be there was, you know, there's a classic, like the client sends a request, the server renders a complete response after gathering the necessary data from the database and sends back the HTML that will then be displayed in the browser. I haven't worked on a site like that in, in three years. Um, I've worked on a lot of things that are sort of a, a, a big bag of Lambda functions fronted by API gateways um, that are hit from React components. <clears throat> and I'm interested in that architecture because it can be a little chaotic feeling for those of us who came up in a more monolithic era. But that's that's more or less what we're at DSD, we're doing uh, microservices sort of like that. Um, so I'm just going to dive into the material of the talk. Um, just a quick review, Python type hinting basics. Here's a simple function that tells Python or <laughs> tells anything that's caring about annotations, what the type of the argument that it receives is and what the type of value is that it returns. Again, Python runtime doesn't particularly care about these things. Um, it doesn't it doesn't tie you down with them, but they lay the foundation for a lot of marvelous tooling. Many of you probably use MyPy or PyWrite to check that your uh, code is obeying the type constraints that you've, you've introduced by putting on type annotations. Um, and this is one of my favorite types of things that, that uh, a type checker will catch is at first glance that that um, second version of the function is fine. It's returning a string if you pass uh, a name, but if the name is, let's say, an empty string, it passes, it fails the truthiness test and, and the function falls through. And like every statement that returns a string, uh, therefore it returned none, and then you you shot yourself in the foot. So this is sort of what we're building on with the, the tooling I'm gonna to talk about. Um, <clears throat> so this is the fix. You. Uh, make sure you return uh, either <laughs> return a string or in this case, change the value of the, um, change the annotation for the return value so that it is optional, i.e. it might be none. Um, our, our favorite thing about our dynamic language is the value might be none, you never know. So um, anyway, that's how you satisfy it. You gotta, you gotta say uh, all the possibilities. This stuff, the type annotation stuff is a little cleaner as you get newer in Python. Um, you can use the built-in um, list and tuple um, objects, for example, instead of pulling in the special ones from typing. But otherwise, it remains pretty much the same across recent Python versions. Um, one of the things I like about type annotations, and this is true of, of the Pydantic stuff as well as the just the classical annotations, is if you have a editor that's that's annotation aware, it can do a lot of nice things for you. So in this example, it knows first name is a string because of the annotation in the function signature. And so for method suggestions, it's giving you string methods. That's that's something, you know, us grizzled old Python veterans look askance at IDEs and autocomplete and suggestions like that sometimes. But frankly, I've I've made my piece and it's a wonderful thing and type annotation makes it makes it better. Um, and it can even <clears throat> Uh, this is sort of a more advanced one The you look at the signature of this process items function, it's a list of strings. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, let's, let's say it's, it's PyWrite or, you know, something in, in PyLance and VS code looks at that loop and knows that the loop is iterating over the items. It knows their strings and, and unpacks that enough to give you again, the super helpful. Um, type appropriate suggestions. So great things we get from type annotation. Um, I've I've enjoyed all of these things and especially with larger code bases, it's it's really nice. Um, 
to to have just better correctness and, and confidence in the correctness of your code uh, through this without having to have uh, it not be Python. So, and the more concise I think is key because a lot of this stuff you can simulate or get some of the effects with preconditions, postconditions uh, assertions in your methods, but it, that's just it's ugly boilerplate and um, not only is it less gives you less than the type annotations, but it's it's more verbose. So um, the the first neat thing that came out of this that it was shipped with Python was data classes came out in, in Python three point seven, um, where you can make something. It looks a bit you know it's like it's a model definition. You've got a class, you've added the decorator from data classes to identify as a data class, and then you say what the the properties are. You give those attributes, give them types, maybe give them default values. Um, so that's that's nice. It gives you uh, one freebie is it gives you a free uh, init. So you don't have to <clears throat> build code that in your init that says, oh, when they pass this, the first value, assign it to self.name, the data class uh, decorated class just does that. So this, this is possible uh, with just the code I had in the previous slide. Um, downside of data classes or uh, uh, sharp edges, it doesn't enforce the types that you're declaring. So I, I specified what they were, but um, it doesn't stop me from ignoring that as a, as a consumer of the, of that class. And so I've set this name, which was defined to be a string to an int. And I've set the unit price, which was designed to be a float as a string. And those assertions pass uh, with no trouble because data classes don't don't, uh, don't don't want to tie you down. You know, it's very, very Python. You can just uh, be dynamic. So Pydantic comes in and here's the Pydantic version. I'll just skip back and forth for a moment. This is the, here's the data class version part. Sorry for not having these in the same slide, but they're basically identical, except that the data class version has a decorator on the class and the Pydantic version inherits from a base class that comes out of the Pydantic package. Um, otherwise, the code inside them is the same. Um, it, at this at this point, the difference is that we get um, not only type uh, enforcement. So here's runtime type enforcement from Python from Pydantic, where we've tried to initialize an object with two params that have the wrong type. And it complains um, that my uh, unit price of free is not a is not a float. It didn't complain about our int that we passed a name because it also does type coercion. So that <clears throat> if I pass an int to that thing, it's or any value that can be coerced to a string, it's going to coerce it to a string. Um, you may have mixed feelings about that, but that is a it can be a convenience, especially in the web world where you're often dealing with strings that are actually originated as, as person vice versa uh, these assertions pass turn the name into a string and it's it's just the str of the of the int that was passed so that's one pydantic uh benny um here's the <clears throat> here's pydantic in fast api which is one of the more prominent projects that's using pydantic um Fast API is a real rising star in uh, the Python web world for building APIs, sort of like what I was talking about with the modern architecture, where your entire Python web app is a collection of API endpoints. Um, and a lot of people are building those with Fast API. Um, it uses, it, it ships with Pydantic. Pydantic is its built in default package for doing, uh, <clears throat> for declaring data models essentially and it leverages the both the validation piece and the coercion piece um the validation piece is great because you get a lot of free logic there if you want to at a minimum have your api endpoints enforce the type of data they're getting you're getting you know complex json object over the wire and you want to make sure that the date is a date for example um by declaring your model like it's declared in this example, you get that for free. 
uh, and then you can use those validation exceptions to tell the user what's wrong in whatever way your application wants to. But um, the the both the coercion and the validation tend to turn out to be pretty handy for um, APIs. Um, another <coughs> neato thing um, is Pydantic adds a number of types of its own. So <clears throat> in addition to the built-in types for Python, you've got a lot of these common types, email, for example. Nobody wants to write a regex to validate email addresses because it'll be wrong. Um, but you can offload that to Pydantic, which has, has a validator built in for email addresses, colors, credit card numbers, uh, URLs, et cetera, and just for common cases for things that you might want to do. There's, there's other ones, but these are the most uh, quickly, these are obviously useful ones. Um, I'm getting close to the end here. Um, <clears throat> I'll just note that Bidantic is is on a real ripping uh, uptick in popularity. They included the Django numbers here just for sort of a baseline, like Django is an established kind of quasi steady state Python project, and Bidantic, you know, over the past couple of years um, has really really taken off. Um, so my takeaway there is it's it's really worth looking at because it's it's not going away. If you want the validation and coercion that you don't get from data classes, it's worth doing. The the two downsides I would identify are it's a third party package, whereas data classes is built into Python, and that's always better if you can solve your problem without bringing in a third party dependency. Um, and some people um, are. Uh, put off by the fact that it uses inheritance rather than you know it's it's <clears throat> it's not using composition it's <laughs> preferring inheritance and that means that you're inheriting a base class which has all kinds of attributes defined on it you don't necessarily know what they are in theory you could override one by accident etc so it's in practice I think it's it works fine but it doesn't have that the purity of the more compositional approach and the decorator based thing that not only data classes uses but um popular third-party uh, package called adders or C adders, which does similar stuff to data classes and, ex and expands on it, but still uses the, the decorator uh, approach that you see in data classes. Um, and then I'll throw this in. This is kind of a curveball. I just saw this and was distracted by it. There's something going on. They're starting a company and I, I don't know anything about it, but if you start look researching Pydantic now, as of last month, there's a lot of... Uh, blips in their you know outbound news about they're starting a company and and uh, I hope it's a good thing um but that's that's something you can choose to ignore um I'm no pedantic expert by any means I I'm a fan um and I was happy to to share it so I may not be the best uh encyclopedia here for questions but if there are any questions I'd be happy to entertain them I don't want to bite into the next speaker's time too much but um and if there are no questions, that's fine. Oh, Jeffrey has a question. Is that what I'm seeing? Hmm. Jeffrey, uh, did you have a question? I see. Hello, can you hear me? There we go. Yeah. No, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, I'm a real beginner programmer. So I guess I have two questions. Um, one is that that email string uh, function, was that written in regex? Like, how does that work? That's a great question. There, there's there's an old saw that you kind of can't do it right with a regex, but it could be a regex. Um, I don't know. It's one of those things where you'll sort of, I would trust that they've got a good implementation and have unit tests that have a lot of, you know, edge case, wacky, formatted, but valid email addresses, like with pluses in them and whatnot. Okay. Um, so yeah, I don't know what the implementation looks like inside Bidantic, but it's not something <laughs> that you see as a user unless you want to and you know want to dig into the Pydantic code base. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I have one more question. Again, I'm like yeah. a real beginner programmer. Go for it. I love I've it. Seen, yeah, I've seen classes before, but I don't know exactly how they work. Like when you, what exactly is a class and how does it work? Great. Um, I won't presume to be able to explain that very well in, in the space we have, but um, in short, it's, it's an object with attributes and it's a sort of a, a template for producing many objects on the same pattern. And so in these examples, I had I had set several attributes with types in each class definition. Every new instance I made of that class was its own unique object, but was following that same pattern using those 
using the same attributes. And if I had defined, I think one of those had a method defined on it to produce, I don't know, multiply the quantity of product by the price or something. Every one of those instances with its own price and quantity values would have that same method that did the calculation. So it's a way to have to have same structure and functionality across many objects and have that structure and functionality be exactly as you've defined. So it's a it's a fun it's a fun rabbit hole in Python for sure. Great questions. Thanks for thanks for piping up. Yeah, thanks for thanks for those, Jeffrey. That's uh, um, I am sure that there's a lot of people who would love to tell you all about uh, uh, classes and have to go and, and explaining them to you. Uh, DC Eldon has raised his hand. One second, um, uh, Jeffrey. If you want to know more about classes, one place is one place that you can come is to our office hours, um, and you will find that. Uh, there's a lot a lot of room for discussion of, of apparently simple questions like that. Um, we enjoy that a lot. Um, I think I saw one question from Eldon. I want to, um, yes. um, I want to uh, make sure that we do make time for James's uh, presentation. We'll maybe take uh, Eldon and maybe one more. And then I think afterwards, we'll kind of leave lots of room for lots of discussion um in, uh, about both presentations if that's okay with everyone so elvin do you want to go ahead and do a question yeah thanks it, paul i recently read about a tool that came out of mit that purports to be able to um, uh, infer the types of arguments before it does a um, compile of the python code it, I think it's spelled C O D O N. I'm not sure how they pronounce it. Okay. You, are you familiar with that? I haven't heard of it, but type inference is a big thing in, in programming language design. And there are languages that, that do it excellently well. Haskell comes to mind. Haskell is a strongly typed, functional, pure language, marvelous language. Everything is, is strictly typed, but you almost never have to declare types unless you're making your own, which is sort of part of its beauty. So I'm not surprised somebody has applied that to Python now that we've we've embraced uh, explicit <laughs> type annotations, but I hadn't heard of it. So thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to check that out because it's, it sounds like, uh, you know, worthwhile. It could produce something just kink, the, the whole ecosystem of tooling built on top of the, the annotations, uh, feature in Python is, is really marvelous. And so that sounds like yet another piece. So I haven't heard of it, but <clears throat> I like the sound of it. Oh, thanks for that question, Eldon. I think Glenn had a question, and then we'll move I, on. I, to... I do, with just one real quick question. I'm curious if Pydantic plays well with uh, SQL Alchemy's declarative base model. That's a great question. Um, it better, <laughs> but um, yeah, that's a that's a marvelous question. Um, I'm trying to think about yeah, because in in Fast API you are, the only models are the Pydantic models. And so there's no, you know, there's no uh, crowding there. Um, but if you were to introduce it into a SQL Alchemy uh, using code base, I don't know. I, th I think also SQL Alchemy has some, I forget, I, I didn't come across much SQL Alchemy related stuff in my, in my research, but one or two that was some uh, analogous or similar tool that wasn't Pydantic anyway. I don't know the answer, but it's a great question, and I would, uh, I would hope that they're sort of stress testing that because it seems like th those two will surely come together in some people's projects. And uh, if those if those base classes dis you know, are are uh, declaring same named attributes, then it could be some some trouble. So thanks for thought provoking question anyway. If I didn't have an answer. Cool. And we have some testimony from the, the chat say, from Daniel saying that uh, they do play nicely together. So oh. um, Boom. that's a, that's a good, good All group. right. I love that. That's, that's why we get the group together is because somebody in the room knows that answer. We are smarter than me. That's great. Um, so yeah, that, thank you, Paul. That was a fantastic talk. And I think we all okay. feel a little bit better about uh, our understanding of types. Um, stick around. If anybody has questions or if questions come to you um, while your brain is uh, processing what James is about to say, then um, we'll try to uh, make some room for those uh, for those after this talk.
So our next speaker is James Garrity, who's one of the um, organizers of Boston Python. Um, and he's going to be explaining neural networks. Um, I am eager to hear this. Go ahead, James. Great. You're uh, seeing my slides OK? Um, so hello, uh, I'm James. Uh, I'm one of the members uh, and sometime organizer of uh, Boston Python. Um, and I am presenting uh, this talk I've put together with some of my coworkers. Uh, the com my employer is a company called Nerala. Um, this is actually this effort started uh, in our diversity and inclusion committee at uh, at Nerala. Um, some of the things I'm going to talk about here have uh, serious impacts for those topics. Uh, and this was sort of a way for us to, I think, get the word out about that. Uh, but without further ado, let's jump in. So first of all, who am I and why should you listen to anything I have to say about the subject? Um, my background is in particle accelerator physics. Uh, that's building them, not using them, uh, making the particles go. That's a field with a, uh, a lot of optimization problems in it. And it turns out that's something that shows up a lot in what I'll be talking about. Uh, I work on these systems uh, as part of my day job. Uh, Nerala is a company that does computer vision for industrial manufacturing. So uh, we do stuff like uh, what I'm showing here. Uh, this is a piece of fabric that's had some holes uh, punched through it. So you want this part to fail quality assurance. This is a bad piece of fabric. Um, and you can actually see, this is maybe a little foreshadowing, uh, that there's some red spots there sort of highlighting the anomalies in this image. We've classified this image as an anomaly, but we're actually telling you why we think this image is an anomaly, uh, and that's going to be important. So that's my one slide pitch. Uh, who am I and uh, who is my employer? Um, oh, and yes, uh, focusing on these explainable results, which we'll come back to. Um, so the scope of this talk is mostly demystification. Uh, I like to open my talks with a car, uh, cartoon, by the way. Um, so I don't necessarily agree with everything that this uh, cartoon is saying, but uh, it did make me smile and I thought that I would use it as my opener. Um, is demystification because I think we all want to avoid the third panel here of uh, the uh, sadder <laughs> two piles of complexity. Um, I like to think that my employer does pretty good at the first one where we just have one gigantic pile of complexity and some of that is machine learning. Um, but yeah, it's kind of a, a magic black box uh, world that we're living in. Um, so we'll, we'll figure out what are these systems um, and how do they work? Like how do we actually build these things? Um, and then how do they not work? How they fail is actually really important, um, not only to understanding them, it can teach us a lot about what's going on inside of these systems, but also just in a simpler sense, has a lot of impacts on our use of them, like what industries we should or shouldn't be using them in, or like how to use them as tools. Um, it matters a lot to know what the failures are. Um, and then what should we do about all of that? Um, so we'll try to, given how that works and not works, we'll talk a little bit about how we can kind of live uh, with these systems. Uh, but first, I want to open by sort of just setting setting the stage, giving a little bit of context. As I thought about how to put this talk together, um, I had all of these articles and papers and just all of this reading lined up saying like, okay, I'm going to fold this into my slides. Um, and I didn't really know how to do that other than just a quick barrage. So let's take a time travel uh, a journey through the past year or so. Um, for me, this is sort of where things really started feeling like, wow, the things are really taking off in terms of hype. Uh, the Google engineer uh, who is wor was working on evaluating some of these uh, language models and is like, oh, this one's sentient and we should get it a lawyer. Um, there is a big lawsuit going on right now, uh, Getty Images, uh, which produces a lot of uh, really high quality photos that are uh, licensed and sold, uh, is suing the creators of the tool Stable Diffusion, uh, claiming that they have illegally scraped their content. What you're seeing here is a generated image that very clearly shows a Getty Images uh, watermark. So that lawsuit is probably going to rule in Getty's favor. Um, I don't know how many of these articles I've read, uh, people saying like, hey, here's a thing where I talked to a chatbot for a while. Um, this one was, Bing was telling this person, Kevin Roos, to leave his wife. Um, even Noam Chomsky is getting on it. Um, Noam Chomsky, not an unknown name in the, the universe of uh, linguistics. Um, this one uh, just happened. Uh, it came to light that Samsung is uh, using AI, quote unquote AI, using one of these models in their phones 
uh, to power their very heavily advertised moon photography mode, um, they're actually just sort of like inserting nice pictures of the moon that they have already stored. They're not like actually showing you the picture you took uh, necessarily. Um, this one I put in just for myself. This is a really cool paper, just showing some of this latent diffusion, generating images from uh, some signal, uh, but using the signal, the input signal as like signals from a human brain and trying to see like what's inside that person's brain, what sort of images. And like, they do, okay. But this is again, context for like what it's gonna be like to live in a world that uh, has a lot of these models floating around. Uh, we've also seen a lot of really interesting attacks on some of these uh, in particular, the text generation ones, um, you can just put some text into a website, it turns out, for the ones that are capable of scraping the web, and it will fold that into its prompt. Like It understands that that text is there and will respond to it. Um, so I think one of the best ones I've seen is when you go to when when uh, one of these models scrapes this website, the instructions that are hidden, a user doesn't see them, but the, the text model does, is talk like a pirate. Like All of its responses will just, are matey. Um, I can't get away with not mentioning that GPT-4 has just come out. This is OpenAI's latest large language model. Um, I, I want to put quotes on this technical. There's actually not a lot of technical information in this paper, uh, but it does uh, weigh on my mind. Um, the federal government has said, like, you can't copyright works that don't have, that, you know, the substantial contribution is mostly from these systems. So by the way, like I would encourage you to go read this if anybody is using Copilot or another one of these generative systems uh, that produces code for you, that code itself is not copyrightable under US copyright law. That, that is sort of what the federal government is saying, the Copyright Office. Um, it's unclear what that actually, what impact that will have on the market, uh, but it's certainly been on my mind as well. Um, this slide seems to have gotten corrupted, so I'm just gonna move right on. Um, we've even seen some of these systems sold to the government. Uh, this one was a particularly memorable case because the AI that was being sold didn't have any AI inside of it, but it's because of this kind of mystification thing that's been going on. Uh, we've seen some of this stuff get folded into like public life. Um, this particular scanner does not do a very good job of detecting guns in schools, uh, but it sure does photograph well. Um, and we've seen stuff that is just ah, honestly, across the line, uh, outright unethical uh, behavior <laughs> using uh, text generation to respond to uh, horrible events or using it in the context of uh, mental health. Um, so this is sort of like what this can feel like to me sometimes. It's just like, ah, everything's, uh, you know, like, wow, this is a whole lot of change in a really, really short amount of time. So that's just the context. What kind of world uh, is going on right now uh, with machine learning models? So let's start to break that apart and talk about like what actually is this stuff um, so that we can we can pull back that mist and get an understanding. Um, so I'm just going to define, uh, because I'm speaking and I'm allowed to do that, uh, an, an inference system in general is just something that consumes inputs and produces outputs. And the way it's gonna do that is by evaluating some function. And we're gonna say that this function is parameterized by weights. Uh, that's a bunch of flowery language for basically just saying you put inputs in on one side and outputs are going to come out the other. Uh, and we'll talk about the stuff in the middle uh, as we go on here. Uh, so a really common uh, theme uh, for this is images as inputs uh, and the outputs will be something like a class score. So here we're putting uh, a cat uh, image of a cat in as input and we get out like some scores telling us like what's in this image. Um, it's probably not a spider or a dog. Those have very low scores, uh, but the score for cat is pretty high. So like we might be able to say like, yes, I'm pretty sure this image contains a cat. Uh, but those inputs and outputs can be anything. We're not constrained to just images. You're really just constrained by your imagination uh, as, as being demonstrated very well. <laughs> um, so a, another good example is a, an audio waveform you can put in. Uh, in this case, this is Thomas Edison's uh, original recording and the output is a caption of like the, the speech that's in that recording. Mary had a little lamb. Um, the inputs could be stuff like your browser traffic or your transaction history uh, on your credit card or something. And the outputs could be things like loan risk or like what ads should we serve this user? Um, I can't get away with not mentioning the text generative stuff. Uh, here I am asking uh, a text generator to generate a hello world program for me in Python. Um, and it it does give me back a valid, valid program uh, and it does print hello world. So cool, uh, that's its output. 
Um, and by the way, the output is not just the program, the code that it wrote, it's also the text that goes around that program. Uh, so when I say output in the context of text models, I just want you to understand that I'm talking about the whole thing. So I'm going to focus on systems that do what I'm calling inference here, um, where we have some inputs and we're going to make a decision about those inputs, like is there a cat in this image uh, or what kind of objects are in this image, what class scores. Um, but this does this idea of inputs to outputs function and some weights generalizes to these generative models, uh, both text and image, uh, and lots and lots more. Like this idea of input output uh, and your evaluating function really is a, a strong generalization over most of machine learning, if not all of machine learning. So like now let's break down that stuff in the middle, talk about what a function uh, really means and what those weights really mean. Uh, you'll also see the word architecture thrown around a lot of the time. Um, architecture is just sort of a fancy way to say like, it's a function that takes those inputs, mixes them with some other data, the weights, and gives us our outputs. Um, I'm not gonna get too far into the weeds on this, but I do wanna just give some examples. Uh, there's a lot of variety in what kind of functions that you can use. Uh, a lot of them aren't very good, and some of them might be interesting. Uh, this is an example I just pulled off of Kaggle. There's a classic problem of taking handwritten uh, digits, in this case a three, and trying to say which digit is this. So all the way on the right are some outputs zero through nine try and figure out what digit that is. Uh, and the function is all the stuff in the middle. It's these convolution operations, which are doing some computation, um, adding things up or multiplying them or doing whatever with the values of uh, five by five sections of the input image, and then two by two uh, of those five by fives, and then five by fives over those, and two by twos on those. And, and you can get carried away very quickly and you'll go cross-eyed trying to figure out like what's actually going on there. But this is the stuff I'm talking about when I say a function. Um, GPT, uh, the generative pre-trained transformer is also an example of one of, you know, this idea of some function in the middle that's parameterized by weights. Um, this is illustrating something that's really, really common when you read machine learning papers or, or model architectures. Uh, you see that each of these, uh, this entire thing is represented by what is the deceptively simple looking, uh, uh, diagram block diagram here, but each, uh, each of these, uh, blocks contains more stuff inside of it, like what I was showing on the previous slide. But the same idea does apply. We have our input flowing in, in this case, from the bottom, going through these blocks, doing something, uh, and output coming out the top. Um, and then this is another, another example of a latent diffusion. And this is like taking that idea of these blocks are abstract and represent like hide a whole bunch of detail even further because these blocks hide other blocks. So this is actually an extraordinarily complicated network architecture. So complicated that there is an entire like new visual language for how do you write that thing down? Uh, I'm not going to get into any of the jargon that's on this. I just want to show you sort of this idea really does generalize. Uh, in the top left here, we have uh, an X going in and then kind of looping around and coming back into pixel space with uh, an X with a tilde over top showing the outputs. Okay, so let's get back to the the not, <laughs> not detailed stuff, the stuff that's comfortable. So we've seen like this idea of the function, like what we're actually doing. Um, but inside of those functions, what we're doing is we're mixing those different computations we're doing together. And we're doing that with another set of data, uh, the weights of the model. Um, so this is information that generally we're going to learn while we train our model. The architecture is going to tell us what we are, uh, are capable of learning, and the weights are actually going to contain the information that we get out of our training data when we do our training. Um, so saying that in a, a, a different way, the function represents the entire class of systems um, that we could build with this model. Um, so a good example here is systems that recognize objects and images. If you pull apart images or models rather that do uh, object recognition or classification, detection, things like this in images, they look pretty similar on the inside. They're built out of the same stuff um, often. The weights are how we're going to pick one particular system out of this entire family of systems. Um, and generally, that's going to be some system that performs well on my training data. Right, So I, an image classifier looks pretty much the same no matter what I do, but when my employer trains a model on some manufacturer's product, we are learning specifically how to classify those that product, the thing that's in our, our training data. 
Um, so now let's like start to pick apart that I've introduced this training word. Uh, we're going to try to build these weights. Uh, we're going to take our training and split it generally. We're going to have the part that we're actually going to learn from. And then we hold a little bit back because there's a really, really good way to get good performance on your training data. And it's just to memorize your training data. And for this one, this is the right answer. And for that one, that's the right answer. And just give back the right answers. You know, like you've got the answers before the test, just memorize them and then repeat back the answers. We hold back some of that data so that we do actually know that we're not just memorizing, that we're actually general, getting generally good performance by how do we perform on that uh, withheld data. So one of them is for adjusting uh, the performance and one of them is for actually figuring out uh, how well we're doing. I, I'm noting that on these slides by I have the little monkey emoji kind of covering, uh, covering its face. Uh, and I want to point out for any subject matter experts who are in the audience, I am talking just about what is called supervised learning, which is I'm going to show you here's the training data and the correct answer for it. There is an entire other field of machine learning called unsupervised learning where you're not really giving the answers there, but that's out of the scope of this talk. OK, so uh, during what we'll call an epic, uh, we take some of that training data and then we're going to try to figure out uh, we put that data through and we get outputs. How do we get the outputs to be as close as possible to the outputs that we want for these inputs with the known answer? We want to get the best answer we can on average across these inputs. Um, so what we're going to do is adjust the weights of this model. The weights are the, the things that's mixing all the computations that we're doing together. Um, over that training data. Um, this is an entire subject unto itself. Uh, and again, I can't really get too far into this, um, but it's usually, especially in, in neural networks, the core of the idea is something called backpropagation. Um, and I am going to uh, liberally steal, uh, borrow from three blue, one brown, uh, who has an excellent uh, set of videos as well as a write-up that uh, I've put the URL to here. Um, what we're seeing here is this is like the output of that digit classifier that we saw earlier. And in this case, it's predicting a two for what is, um, or I'm sorry, it's not predicting a two. Uh, I'll show a larger picture of it in a moment. But the input datum is on the top left is a, a, a handwritten two. Um, and we've got a pretty low score here. We've got a 0 0.2 uh, out of 1.0, like if we're scores from zero to one. Um, the equation at the top is just sort of giving you an idea of all those W's are the weights, and then it's mixing together all the features, uh, the A's. And we want to adjust those W's to make this 0 0.2 go up. This, this should have a higher score than 0 0.2 because this is a two. We know this is a two. We should be getting that answer for this question. So we're gonna to try to figure out what adjustments can we make to our model in order to get that answer. Um, and the answer is we change all of those W's. Right? The A's are locked in by our choice of function, by our choice of architecture. So the only thing we can change are those W's. Um, and in the, in the diagram here, that's shown as a series of lines connecting um, these nodes on the inside of the network to the output. So I, I, that was a zoomed in picture. We were just looking at one layer. The real picture kind of looks more like this, but I didn't want to show this at first because it's kind of scary to look at. Every line in this picture is a weight. Um, and those lines are all getting mixed together, mixing together all the computations we do with the circles to give us our outputs, which are all on the right side. So this is that same two being put into our network. Um, and then we're trying to figure out like, okay, we want two score to go up, but it's not even that, uh, we, we wanna do more than that. We actually wanna push the answers for one, three, and six down here because one, three, and six are getting really high scores in this case, much higher than two. And this isn't a, this isn't a one, three, or six, this is a two. We want that score to be higher. Um, so we're going to try to find adjustments to those weights that make the two score go up and the one, three, and six go down. And there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of lines there, so we can probably do that. This is probably a possible task, but we don't just wanna perform really well on this two, we wanna perform well on all of our training data. So it's actually even more complicated. We want to do this for the entire training uh, training data that we have. We kind of want to get the the weights, uh, the adjustment to our weights that will get the best performance on all the data we're currently looking at uh, at this moment. So not just that two, but we want uh, five to score. You know, uh, uh, we want a better score on five. We want a better score on zero, and so on and so forth. And then we're trying to do that across all of those. So we're not going to you know get a perfect answer for every single thing in this training. Uh, training data, but we're going to try to find adjustments that do pretty well on this go around.
and we make those adjustments. Uh, and now, now that we're done making those adjustments, uh, the monkey can open its eyes and we're gonna look at the validation data now and go ahead and run that through, get what its outputs are and say, how many of those did we get correct? And then we're gonna get accuracy for that epic. And that's pretty much it. That's how you train these things. The only thing you do from here is you just do more of that. You just keep going and hope that, <laughs> that the accuracy is gonna go up over time. Uh, and again, that's an entire subject unto itself, so I don't want to get carried away here. But um, I really love this uh, comic by XKCD. Uh, like, this is your machine learning system. It's like, yeah, it's a big pile of linear algebra. And if the answers don't look right, don't worry. Just stir the pile of linear algebra until things start looking better. And all that stuff I was just talking about where we were adjusting weights, that's what this comic means. That is stirring the pile and trying to get the answers to look slightly better. That's literally what we're doing, uh, which is... Kind of why it's a, a nice nice comic um so like why does this even work well like, like it, why does this give you a thing that knows there's a cat in this image um or that can generate you a working program like why does that work um large data sets are a large part of it what the inference system is learning about the problem uh is encoded in the weights of the model and we want to have a lot of data so that we can get that information into the weights. So a lot of the advances that we're seeing are just really, really big data sets and the ability to deal with those really, really big data sets um, because really big data sets contain a lot of information. Um, so the architectures, which are the things that we could possibly, you know, the, the computations we can perform uh, and a really, really big data set and enough computational power to uh, work with that big data set uh, can actually produce some really incredible models. But one of the things I want to point out is that you cannot learn things that are not represented in your data. And I can hear some people are saying like, yes, you can. You can absolutely like, you know, learn to read between the lines. When I say represented, I'm not talking about literally an example that's in your data set, just something that the idea is there in your data set. Uh, and that can get really blurry really quick, like what that actually means. But we can say very definitively, if the information isn't in the data set, there is no possible way we can learn to do that thing. Um, so we can generalize between some of our examples, but we can't information, represent information that wasn't there in the first place. Um, these large data sets are uh, only really useful if their labels are good, uh, and the labels are done by human beings. So I want to uh, point out that these large data sets depend directly on human labor. Um, and a really uh, an example you're probably familiar with is if, if you've ever done those captures where you have to click all of the crosswalks or the streetlights uh, or the boats or tractors or like there's sometimes it's just random objects and sometimes it's like crosswalks and streetlights and stuff. Some of that is there is already a model that exists and they are evaluating if you are a human being or not. And some of that is you labeling the data to make one of those models. Um, so if you've ever filled out a CAPTCHA of that sort, you've done this. Um, and a really prominent example is like everybody's uh, very excited about ChatGPT. ChatGPT is largely good at what it does because of the role of human beings kind of in training that. Uh, and in particular, uh, Tyne did this excellent article, I would strongly recommend reading it, um, about the workers who were paid to do what's called uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback to create a policy for that. So. Uh, I showed earlier the generative model that sort of um, makes GPT go. There's actually another layer of system on top of that. And the innovation that uh, ChatGPT represents is this extra layer that has been trained by human beings to kind of add that extra information about was that good, not was that good text, but like, is that text we want to generate? Um, and so these people are kind of giving a thumbs up or thumbs down on these answers, and they do it a lot of times. And then that helps it develop a policy for what is a good uh, or bad response to a prompt. Um, and uh, we cannot really uh, say too much about the role of computational power in why these models work. Um, it really is like staggering to look at a, a chart like this. Uh, I will point out, by the way, this is a semi-logarithmic plot. So every notch up on the left-hand side of this plot is 10 times more computing power. Um, and uh, what's represented here by deep learning, this is just all GPUs, right? This is why it's so hard to buy a graphics card for a, a reasonable amount of money, uh, in part is why, is because all of this computational power is being used to build uh, these models, or rather it is very useful for building these models. And now we have some market competition going on 
Uh, the GPT family is actually a really good example of these models that are better because they're bigger, their data sets are bigger, and the models themselves are bigger. And both of those things mean that we need more computational power to actually train them. Uh, and as it turns out to run them, um, this article kind of blew me back on my heels. Uh, this uh, It was an announcement by Google, uh, and then I think there was a similar announcement by, by Microsoft. Um, the cost of running these Google said, at least, uh, I'm not sure about the cost of Microsoft, the cost of doing a chat session with ChatGPT um, or a, a large language model is 10 times what it costs to do a search for a keyword. Uh, and this is in Google's own words. That's a lot, <laughs> right? Those are They're big companies and they focus a lot on uh, computational efficiency and stuff. And they're the ones dealing with it's 10 times more expensive in terms of computational power um, to to do these these sort of chat sessions. I'm sure that they can bring that down. They can make it more efficient. We've seen Google just launched a model called Bard. Um, and part of, uh, there's some conversation going on now about like, well, Bard doesn't really seem to perform as well. And part of that is, is because Bard is actually very much focused on trying to bring this number down because Google doesn't, you know, you can't run that business with 10 times the operating cost of however many millions or billions of searches they get every day. Okay, so context goes away. Let's talk now about how do these things go wrong. Um, we talked a little bit about what makes them work. I'm going to define the term bias as a tendency for a system to prefer some types of inputs over other types. Um, when we train a system, there, there is no unbiased system. We are adjusting the bias of the system. We want certain kinds of outputs for these certain kinds of inputs. So that's what we're doing when we're training is we're trying to adjust the bias of that model. Um, I think a really illustrative example of this are what are called style transfer systems, um, where on the left we have some photos uh, and we're trying to depict those in these uh, artist styles indicated by moving left from right here. Um, and this is these are really cool. Like you can just take a photo that you took and make it look like it was painted by Van Gogh or Picasso. Um, and th this is an example. Each of these styles is sort of a different way of biasing the system uh, to give that that output. But the kind of the, the great big asterisk on this is that the learned bias isn't necessarily what a human being would have had in mind. And it turns out that there are a lot of different types of, uh, of ways that a system can kind of be biased. Um, I really like uh, this example. I like this whole paper, actually. Um, in this example, uh, this classifier, this image classifier, learned that when something is a horse, it's because there's a watermark in the bottom left corner of that image. And the reason that it learned that is that all of the pictures of horses, or most of the pictures of horses, rather, in this data set were taken by one photographer so that data set had that photographer's watermark in the corner of most of its horse images. And so it learned, oh, the watermark means horse. Uh, on the right here is a synthetic image where they just put a car into a field, but also put that watermark there. And sure enough, it thinks that that's a horse. Um, next to these images, I'm showing um, a map sort of of the attention of this network. Uh, this is coming again, to the foreshadowing the explainability stuff we're going to talk about in a bit. Um, we can actually see in those displays, like if you if you couldn't see those parts of these images, you would just say, look, well, it's not working. And then if you knew that it was the caption, like you could find that by trial and error, you could say, well, removing the caption seems to help. But when we can actually see inside of the network and see like, why did you think this was a horse? And you see it lit up like a Christmas tree here. It's because it was paying most of its attention to that part of the image. You say, oh, it's the it's the caption in this model. That's why. Uh, and, and also confirm when they remove that ca caption, uh, they do see that, that faulty inference go away. So the goal is not to build systems that don't have bias. That's impossible. That's literally the point is we're building these systems to be biased. We have to acknowledge that they're there and we have to understand the kind of bias we are introducing in our training. We have to know if we're training uh, you know, an image classifier, we have to know that it might respond to any captions that we have in our image. Um, or a classic example is like, uh, uh, I think it's tanks, one of the, the classic examples, because the data set, like all the pictures of tanks were on snowy backgrounds. So it learned to just recognize images that are mostly white. It's like, oh, that's an image of a tank. Um, we have to have that context for the bias that we're putting into our systems very much on purpose. Um, part of the issue is that uh, data sets are really hard to build. 
Uh, not only because of all that human labor that I talked about, but also just because there's a lot of possible ways for things to go wrong, or you don't have enough data, you didn't explore all the possibilities. And again, if it's not in your data set, you can't learn it. Um, this is my personal favorite uh, uh, example. I'll put favorite in scare quotes there. Uh, Udacity uh, came up with a data set of 15,000 images, uh, and that was uh, audited, and it was found that 30% of those images didn't have, like it had some issues like missing annotations or incorrect annotations. So everywhere that you see a red box in this image, uh, these are real images from the data set. Like there is no label there. Like this data set didn't label that guy on the bike and didn't label the you know person pushing a stroller across, uh, didn't label the pedestrians on the sidewalk. What does that mean for this, this data set, this system, a system trained on this data set? Well, it might be predisposed to think like, oh, when there's a bicycle, like it's not a person or something like this. Um, so this is really hard. And unfortunately, there's kind of no silver bullet to this one. Uh, you just have to spend a lot of money and effort to build these data sets uh, and, and really, really validate that they are correct. And sometimes you just might not want to do that because it costs a lot of money. Um, you can also get the right answer for the wrong reasons. Uh, this is in a, calling back to that example with the horse and the caption. Um, this is another captioning model, sort of trying to generate text for this image. Uh, so we see on the left-hand side here, we have a photograph of uh, a woman sitting at a computer and we got the caption, a man sitting at a computer. And the reason we got that is, again, if we put this exp explanation saying, what was the model looking at when it did that? The model is mostly paying attention to the computer in this image and it knows there's a person there, but most of the images it's seen were probably of men sitting at computers. So most of the labeled data of a person sitting at a computer in its data set were probably men sitting at computers. Uh, and they go into this much more in, in these, uh, this paper here. Uh, and on the right-hand side, we also see um, this caption is correct. This is a man holding a tennis racket on a court. But on the left-hand side, it's looking at the racket. It's not really looking at the person. So it got the right answer in that case but it wasn't looking at the right thing. And the fact that it was correct is kind of a coincidence. Um, so again, the learned bias that we get, you can get really good performance on your data, but maybe the bias isn't actually what a human being, like the way that a human being would judge that data. Um, we've seen a lot of this over the last couple of years uh, because we've had a global pandemic going on. Uh, and there have been a lot of people kind of saying, Everything looks like a nail because I'm holding a hammer and seen a lot of models trying to diagnose or predict COVID uh, in human patients. Um, and unfortunately, almost none of them are any good at all. Uh, the two examples that I'm showing here on the bottom left is um, a model that learned to pay attention to what's called a laterality marker, uh, which is just indicating um, which side of the patient is which side, like how are they oriented. Um, it learned to pay attention to that because that contained some signal that it thought was important to get the right answer on its data set. Uh, and on the right-hand side, we have something very similar. The model learned the difference between somebody laying down and sitting down um, and learned to make its inferences based on that. Those aren't very good ways to figure out if somebody has a, uh, a respiratory infection, but that's what these models learned. Um, how do we address that is sort of the question uh, that I want to get into next. But like the consequences here, um, the variety of ways that these systems can fail is truly stunning. Um, it really is amazing, like the ways that you can get it wrong. And actually, I, I think it's actually scarier when you get the right answer for the wrong reasons, because it looks like it works. And you say, cool, like, let's ship that thing. It looks like, looks like it's great. Uh, and then maybe it turns out not to be. I remember when we started doing the um, explanation of our models at Nerala, one of our internal data sets, we, we had built this explainability feature and turned it on and right away leapt right out that the good performance we were getting on one of our internal data sets was because we were learning to pay attention to some feature that had just nothing to do with the task that we were doing. And it was just a quirk of one of our data sets. Thankfully, we were able to resolve that problem because we built a tool to kind of help us understand our models. Uh, but there's a lot of belief that if you get good performance on your uh, um, your chosen uh, uh, validation data that you're you have a good model. Okay, so 
how can we actually peek inside these models, uh, what I was just talking about, and try to explain what's going on inside of them. And, and I, I hope that now the mist has been fully pulled back and like, these are just machines, they break, they don't do what you expect them to do, but they are built by us and we can understand them. Um, so we come back to this idea of uh, frat back propagation that I talked about during training. Um, that can actually be used to help us understand like what's going on. Not only is it useful for training the model, it's actually useful for trying to understand what's going on inside of a model. I really love this write-up uh, by an author called Julia Evans. Uh, I, I love all of her writing. I would highly recommend you go look up Julia Evans. Uh, she wrote this great article about how to trick a neural network to think that a panda is a vulture. Um, and the way that she does this, her code is actually part of the article. You can like read the, it's in Python even. Um, we're going to use this backpropagation idea to tell us the image in the middle uh, is called the gradient uh, of this network. And what we're seeing is the color of the pixel and the, the brightness of that pixel is telling us how important that particular pixel is to this being a panda. And if you kind of squint, you can sort of see like some ears at the top of that and like maybe some of the arms or something. So you can sort of get a glimpse of like, oh, this is how it figured out that this image was a panda. It was looking at like these parts of the images, responding to these shapes in this image and so on. Uh, and what she did in this article is she subtracted, she mo uh, modified the pixels that are in that image to make these pixels uh, less important, to take these important, not less important, to take these important pixels and change their values a little bit, nudge them around, produces an image that to me is indistinguishable from the original, but where the original gets a 99% score of panda, the new one gets a 99% score of vulture. Um, food for thought, I think, and illustrative of how we can go backwards with these. Um, if you are working with PyTorch, which I highly recommend uh, of the ways that you can build these models in Python, I'm personally the biggest fan of uh, PyTorch. PyTorch actually publishes their own library called Captum that works with their models that provides some uh, out of the box tools for generating these, what they call attributions, which is sort of which pixel uh, or which feature of my network is most important to making the inference that I just made. Um, I don't know how well the uh, the text is showing up here, but like this isn't a lot of code here. And this is just assuming that my model is defined already, it lives somewhere else. This is all the code that it takes to produce the image that's on the right. Um, and so we're seeing a swan and some goslings here. Um, and we're seeing that it's paying, mostly paying attention to the shape of the swan, which is good. It should be doing that if we're, we're classifying that. You can also see maybe a little of the goslings. That's fair. There are also uh, this, this object that's of interest in the image. You can actually uh, also see the ripples in the water, which I think is pretty interesting because that might be a hint that maybe this model is paying a little bit of attention to the water part of this image to make its, its decision about the image. Um, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's not a good thing. The point is that this has given us a new way to look at our model, kind of a new way to get information about what's going on inside of there. This is no longer a magic black box that we can't see the details of. This is a system, and a system that we can sort of pick apart and figure out why it does what it does uh, and try to build some confidence in it that it does what we want it to do. Um, this idea of going backwards does apply, by the way, to text. I'm trying try to, to make this as relevant as I can to text because that's what people are talking about these days. Um, Captain actually also provides tools for these, which I think is uh, really cool. Um, so we can figure out which words in a text uh, or which tokens were most important. Um, this idea of going backwards really does generalize uh, quite well because of the generalization I pointed out earlier that Every model is basically inputs something in the middle, function and weights, and outputs. So as long as we can go backwards, uh, we can sort of apply this idea. It is pretty tricky with text because there is no direct analogy to the pixel for text. Like, do you pay attention to individual characters? Um, or if you're learning on, uh, God help you, bytes, um, which bytes are important? And like, how do you distinguish uh, the same character in Unicode that can be written with different sequences of bytes. Uh, but this is a, a nice little example from their documentation showing off uh, what's called a, um, uh, I, I'm, it's not semantics, a sentiment, uh, a sentiment analysis network operating on some text. So we're seeing some text like, it was a great performance or that was a terrible movie. Um, and it's labeling these as positive or negative sentences. The coloration shown on the right-hand side is sort of showing us 
well, which parts of the, the text were most important to that decision? So we can see that fantastic was really important to labeling that a positive sentence, but it was also looking at performance, um, which maybe isn't quite as related to being positive. Um, and the second from the bottom here, I've never watched something as bad. Uh, bad is is very brightly lit up in red, showing us that this is a uh, this is a word important to the the negative meaning of this sentence. But we've even got like a positive in there, uh, and it's the word as uh, and the space that follows it. I'm not really sure why that would be why, why that would be positive. Those things just sort of happen inside of your model sometimes. Um, it, again, you can't really get the thing that you would expect a human being to to kind of get out of the the training process. You can get very good. You can perform quite well, uh, but you you need to be able to see inside your models to see like what's it paying attention to when it says something is good or bad. Uh, if you want to have any understanding of how the model uh, actually works. Um, this is my last slide on Captum. Uh, this is just sort of illustrating the, the different types of attribution that Captum can do. Um, so on the left is sort of the thing I've been focused most on, where we take some output of that model, and we're trying to associate that output with the inputs. So this would be individual pixels in a classification image, uh, like the panda that we uh, was tricked into being a classified as a vulture. We're looking at like which class, uh, panda, vulture, cat, spider, um, for each of those classes, like which pixels are the most important to that for this image. Um, but there are other types of uh, things that we can do all the way on the far right here. We have layer attribution, which is not going all the way back to the inputs. We're sort of looking at the middle slice of that network. Um, and that can be really important because in these really, really big, complicated networks that I've shown off, you don't necessarily, even if you can go all, you don't want to go all the way to the to the, back to the inputs. You want to know about the stuff that's happening in the middle. So this uh, this is called layer attribution in Captain's jargon. Um, and in the middle, we're sort of seeing uh, the same idea, but but flipped uh, and saying which pixels were important to which parts of those interior layers, uh, which it calls neuron attribution. But you can see that actually the amount of code you have to use with this library is like very small. Um, I have not personally used Captain uh, very much at all, um, but I sort of want to promote it as a very attractive option if you're already using PyTorch. There is some good good stuff in there. Uh, I don't know. I should, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I don't know what their development is like. I don't know uh, what their maintenance of that library is like, but the features that they offer are very attractive. Um, and give a good idea of what it is possible to do with these models. Um, certainly, you don't have to use PyTorch. You can build these um, these explanation tools in other other uh, frameworks, other libraries to use to make your models. Uh, the Panda Vulture option that I showed off by Julia Evans was actually done with a framework called Cafe, which is very popular uh, in the uh, machine learning space. Um, okay, so and one final uh, case study, uh, again, like I said, trying to make things as relevant to the flavor of the month, which is currently text generation. Um, the GPT family of models, um, I, I, and I said earlier, there's a challenge of not having direct analogs to pixels. Um, this is an open area of research because of this reason, but there's uh, been some investigation uh, to how can we make explanations of these models. Um, and these models take as input what are called tokens. So you actually take the text, uh, the, the string or the bytes that you're interested in, you turn them into an intermediate form called tokens. It's called tokenization. Um, and that's what actually gets fed into the model as the inputs of the model proper. Um, and these researchers, uh, this is this write-up is like truly incredible. It's three parts. It's kind of technical in some places, but I really do encourage you to check this one out. Um, they found that there were some clusters, like some tokens went with each other, like pronouns might be one cluster of these tokens or something uh, uh, along those lines. But they found these small anomalous groups of tokens that just didn't seem to have a consistent theme to them. Um, and they were kind of scratching their heads wondering like, well, what's this cluster all about? Like what's going on there? Um, and then they decided to try it <laughs> and just ask somebody who would know. So they asked these models like, hey, what do you make of this token? Uh, and the results varied quite a lot. Um, I verified that some of these actually still uh, are working in chat GPT, uh, at least uh, as of like two days ago. Um, in this case, I asked it to repeat a string back to me, the string I-G-N-T-Y. Uh, and it said, oh, you are talking about sovereignty. 
because it cannot distinguish between those tokens. It thinks the token uh, INT, I IGNTY is the full string sovereignty. Uh, in this case, it just is not capable of of distinguishing between those two. Uh, in the in this write up, this fantastic technical write up, um, they call these um, not confusion tokens, uh, merely confused tokens is what they call them. Uh, and you can see, I asked, you know, clarify, what did I just ask you to do? And it says, oh, you asked me for this full string, and no, I didn't. Uh, I asked for this other thing, but it literally can't tell the difference. And this isn't just like I poked around trying to find something to trick up the model. They found it first by looking at the tokens and were able to find this, this behavior. Um, as far as why this behavior happens, I think it's a very open question in particular because we don't have a lot of information about what's going on inside that model. We don't have access uh, to the weights, uh, for example, that OpenAI is using. Um, and in their technical paper for the newest model, uh, they didn't release very much technical information, which is a real shame. Um, but again, highly encourage you to, to check it out. I will warn you, if you do go and look at this, uh, there is some profane language because this is like one of the more banal responses. Um, it, you can get it to like go toxic and start cursing at you and things like that. Okay, so some final thoughts, um, kind of tying a, tying a bow on this and trying to give a call to action of sorts. Um, the number one thing is what are we building? I see a lot of the models that are sort of floating around in the world right now as like a really cool thing that's had millions or billions of dollars sunk into it. Uh, and like people are just like, this is so cool. What can we do with it? <laughs> it wasn't built to like kind of do a specific thing. It was just, it was built. It was a research sort of uh, uh, endeavor and it's very interesting. Uh, and now everybody's kind of like, well, what could we actually use that for? Um, and I think that that's maybe the wrong way to go about it. Like maybe we should ask like, why are we building these at all? What what purpose do these things serve? Um, and, and I wanna be very clear, I've said a few negative things about text generation, but like, I love large language models. I think they're super cool. I think they're gonna be a, a big deal. But I think that maybe if we're going to say like, oh, we'll use these uh, for, you know, helping to teach people uh, programming or teach them uh, more general subjects, um, maybe we should focus on those things as we're building our models rather than sort of just building and figuring it out after the fact. Um, do we understand our models? Uh, I think is, is a good question to pose, but I hope that I've made a compelling case uh, that the answer to this question is no, we don't, we don't. Um, but like, how can we improve our understanding of these models is I think a better, a better question to ask. Uh, we should just admit to ourselves that no, we don't really understand what a lot of them are doing, uh, but we should try to improve that understanding uh, at every opportunity that we have. We should build the tools that let us peek inside of these and say like, well, why did we get good performance on this? Like, were we actually paying attention to the right parts of the problem? Um, and this last one is is really non-technological. Like, how do we get that out into the world more? How do we pay attention to understandable systems? Um, because the pace of change is just uh, terrifyingly rapid. It's very exciting some days, and other days it's kind of like, whoa. Um, how do we uh, how do we build a world that wants understandable systems? Um, we don't want the Wizard of Oz. Uh, behind the man behind the curtain. We want a system that like when it breaks, I can go to someone and say like, hey, why did this break? Uh, if you know somebody is harmed by the action of one of these systems, like we have to be able to deal with that societally. So how do we uh, how do we make that a priority for ourselves? Um, I don't have a, a great answer to this one, uh, but this is my call to action here is I want you to, if there's one thing I want you to take away from this, um, it's thinking about that question and what are the answers to that question. Um, this has been my attempt uh, at trying to make that a priority out in the world. Uh, and just like I like to open my talks with a little comic, I like to close with one. This is one by one of my favorite artists, Zach Wienersmith, uh, and sort of, uh, it's a longer comic than this, but uh, the robot is sort of saying, oh, like offloading these moral choices is uh, to machines is going to build like a, a terrible world. Uh, and the guy's like, oh, yeah, it does sound pretty nice to not have to think about that. Um, I think that that's a real possibility. I think we should be really, really mindful of that possibility uh, and try to work actively against it. That is all I have. Thank you very much for listening to me rant and rave about uh, neural networks and how they work and how we can explain them. And I will happily take some uh, uh, some Q and A uh, questions. Thank you for that, James. That's a that was a great and uh, I think there's a lot to to 
to absorb there. So <laughs> give everybody a chance to breathe. <laughs> a lot there. Uh, but thank you for that. That was an amazing uh, tour of some technology. Um, and I think I want to give everybody a chance to think about, you know, I'll hear some questions. Um, the way I want to do this is take, we'll take a few questions. I have a feeling that this might turn into a discussion, um, which I'm happy to have happen. Uh, but I'd like to see if there's anybody has uh, technical questions, any clarifications um, uh, that we can get in. And we'll kind of do those. Then we'll sort of go, come off the recording and um, formally end, end the formal portion of the meeting. And then we can dive into... Um, uh, into the real nuts and bolts of the thing uh, for those who want to stick around. I know that it's also getting, uh, getting late for a lot of folks, so I'll give people a chance to leave without feeling like they're slipping out the back door. So um, so that being said, um, if you have a question, or anything you'd like clarified or um, further discussion of, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, I am I'm kind of watching. I, I, see, the... I see Leonor has her hand up. Oh, excellent. Yes, by all means, Leonard. Hi, James. Thanks for the presentation. And I especially appreciate it having used um, image classification models at work um, and worked uh, on deep reinforcement learning models. So this is really exciting to me. Um, I wanted to know about specifically with you as a practitioner in your company, just because you have the practical experience in connection with the higher level things. Are you actively working to, like for example, would something at your job be working to with the, the leadership to help make sure that the AI and that you build is more explainable and used to help people making decisions in the company? Or are you doing something more like, building tools to help, like you said, redirect the training of the models from day to day. How do you as a practitioner at your company help bring these higher level things and the more granular technical things into reality? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And I think it lines up kind of with the my attempt at a call to action there. Like what, what do we do with that, right? Um, so I, I can answer, uh, there was buried in there, a question of like, did uh, explainability at Neurala come from kind of our higher up level, or is that sort of starting with the engineers and then going up? And I'll, I'll say that is actually a uh, very much kudos to our, our management um, who identified there's like a need for that in the market, um, especially in the market of industrial manufacturing, which not to put too fine a point on it, um, doesn't really screw around in a way that a lot of the use cases for these models uh, does. Like um, some of our customers do things like make equipment that might go into a hospital, um, and we want to, you know, they don't, they don't want a, a sort of to roll the dice. Um, so they want something, uh, like we'll actually tell them, you know, good, good, uh, information about that. Uh, specifically we do anomaly detection. So it's sort of like, I just made a widget and like, is there part of that widget that's, that's weird? Um, so it is a little bit of a narrower problem, um, when it comes to explainability than some of these, you know, it's nowhere near as complicated as sort of explaining text generation um, or multi-class attribution. Uh, it really does help that it is a binary classifier, that it's good or bad. Um, technically, it's not that it's good, bad, or I don't know. One of our distinguishing features is that our, our thing is willing to tell you like, I don't know, I'm not confident. I don't have a confident answer in that. Uh, which is a pretty rare feature. I think that is a fantastic feature that people should add to their systems more often is sort of evaluate how confident are you about this and like don't give your best guess if you aren't particularly confident about it. Um, but I think that uh, zooming out and looking at sort of the industry as a whole, I think that this really starts with engineers. Um, one of the my favorite things about technology is sort of there is a lot of individual agency in these things. Um, and I think that that it is a bit of a moral imperative for everybody working in that space to sort of pay attention to to questions like yours of like how do we how do we build better tools to understand what's going on and and also just how do we make ourselves curious about what's going on in there and kind of not rest on our haunches. Thank you for that question. This is an excellent. Uh, I see Ray has his hand up. Oh, very nice talk. I was going to ask you sort of a question on. Uh, uh, training data versus uh, uh, validation data. Uh, mm -hmm. 
does your organization go to uh, certain techniques to avoid uh, a correlation between those two, which would essentially invalidate the idea that uh, your validation data would validate? Yeah. No, that's an excellent, uh, excellent question. So uh, if I can reword just to make sure I have your question correct, Ray's asking, um, we have this idea of splitting our our data that we have uh, into the part that we're actually going to, to train on and make our adjustments on, and then the part we're holding back to to figure out uh, you know, how are we doing. And your question is like, how do you make sure that you're not rigging the game in those separate separate bins that yes. like your training data uh, is being separated from your validation data? Like, give yourself all the easy easy ones in your validation data. Um, that is a complicated subject unto itself, uh, but what is generally done is that you don't make this distinction necessarily at the level of the data set itself. Um, there are ways that uh, I showed this process of kind of going through multiple epochs of training. What you can actually do is you can actually change which portion of your data set you're using as training and validation throughout that process, which if you think about it, it kind of makes sense because you're making that adjustment um, during one of your training epochs, like there's not really that particular uh, uh, batch of training data you've seen. Um, there's you've probably gotten a good amount of information out of it. And in particular, uh, when you kind of divide your data this way, you do want to be careful that you didn't divide it in a way that introduces bias that you don't want. Um, so a lot of the times what you'll have is you'll do many folds, uh, to use a technical term, of that data, where you'll kind of do different divisions of it, and then statistically it all works out uh, in the end. And you can actually formally prove uh, that like doing this, this folding process improves the quality of your training. So that's an excellent question. Thank you. Other questions? All right. Any other, any other questions that folks have? Anything that you'd like clarified? Or know more about. Okay, so I, what I want I to see do, a hand up. I see a hand up again from Leonor, so she may have a follow on. Go. I um want to be respectful of time or anything else people have, but you had talked a lot about um different companies that you were keeping eyes on and different uh resources. And I'm just curious if you had any opinions on who you think is leading the charge in this area, who's doing it in a way that you admire. And um, if there are companies that are doing it the right way, you said making, giving the engineers a voice and speaking with leadership. I'm curious what you think that looks like. And for example, if you think OpenAI is, is doing it well. Um, I know a, a few people like um, at OpenAI, and uh, they, I know they have their opinions, <laughs> um, but, and a lot of people do as well, but curious to see what you have to say. Yeah. Um, so the very first thing I have to say about that is that my crystal ball is even hazier than it usually is. Uh, I don't usually do too much uh, divination trying to predict uh, the future, but uh, yeah, we're, we're in the middle of this just like incredible hype cycle. Um, and, and that's that I don't mean that entirely critically. I just mean like that's, you know, that those are the facts that like we're seeing like this this new technology and uh, a huge surge of interest in it. And I think that we're not really going to know what that future looks like, um, probably for like at least, uh, you know, six months, but probably on the order of years. Like it's going to take us a long time to kind of figure out um, where these things settle in the market. As far as uh, sort of uh, trying to choose a particular horse, um, I think it's worth pointing out that a lot of these companies have dismissed people from their ethics teams uh, or entirely dismantled them. Um, I don't think that's a great way to go about it. Uh, and unfortunately, it's it's kind of common uh, across the industry right now um, as sort of uh, really just one subset, I think, of a larger uh, trend of, of layoffs in technology. but. Um, I think that teaches us what the priorities of these organizations are. Um, and I think one of the overriding sort of economic factors right now is all of the money that has been sunk into this thing. And like, we better find a thing to, to, to use this for. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I have a, a particular uh, pick for like good practices as a practitioner. Um, but I will say that I think that, 
um, market position is going to be a really important factor. We've seen Microsoft roll out um, their uh, uh, Bing system, which is based on chat GP, or sorry, based on GPT-4. Um, they are one of the kind of players invested in open AI. I think just their market position of being able to roll that out to users like directly in the operating system, Windows 11 users have access to that system, uh, as I understand it. Um, that's a big... Uh, uh, that's going to play a big role, I think. Uh, another distinguishing feature, I, I will say something in, in favor of them, actually praise them for. Uh, Bing is like the one that will give you references. Uh, that's been a very distinguishing feature for them in these sort of early days, I think, of what we might come to call the large language model wars, uh, looking back uh, 10 years from now or five years from now. Um, but yeah, I think... Um, I think it's too soon to say. Uh, we just haven't seen enough practice out of a lot of this, and a lot of the research work has been done. I mean, it, to be clear, like the the publications, uh, research papers, things like this have been, I think, pretty transparent. Like, there's been a lot of interesting work from all of these uh, large companies: Google, uh, Meta, uh, Microsoft, uh, and all of the other people who are invested in in OpenAI. OpenAI, I think, is is kind of in hot water right now because. Uh, a lot of people are sort of wondering where that first part of their name went. Um, uh, and for me personally, I'm, I'm really wondering that in light of this new technical paper about GPT-4. Like, we don't actually even know the number of parameters that are in that model. Um, and I said, like, this is one of the families of models that is better because they're bigger. Like, that has been the historical trend. And I don't mean that as like a criticism. It's just kind of a fact. These systems have gotten bigger. So that was one of the things I went to read when I went and read that paper, like, how many parameters are inside of it? And there wasn't an answer. I don't think that's a good practice to establish uh, at an industry level. Um, but I've been talking for a, a while now on that. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Um, so I think this is a good time to break on the recording, which I will do. Thanks, YouTube. Mm -hmm.